pasture for healthy watershed and soils. And you're Thanks, on Ginger. Mass. Awesome. Thanks, Ginger. Thanks, Jason. Thanks mm -hmm. to all the friends. Um, happy to be here. Um, I am here to just tell you a little bit about what we are doing up on Mount Warner. A little background um, for those of you in Hadley, you're familiar with Mount Warner, the, the hill, historically the site of um, apple growing for now about 160 years. Um, and I'm lucky enough to be uh, finding myself there a lot working both for um, owners, Jonathan Carr and Nicole Bum, Carr Cider House, and the actual farm, not necessarily the cider imprint is, you know, now, now sort of being referred to as preservation orchards or new start to this whole agricultural practice up on that site. Um, if any of you have been up there in the past, uh, let's see, four years, you'll have known that there's been quite a few changes, old um, overgrowth and wasteland, sprout land, you know, really heavy with um, vine growth and agriculturally unproductive territory has been really worked back towards productive um, silvopasture, which is the focus of what I want to talk to you guys about and the focus of basically the overarching vision for this, which is, yeah, um, a multi, multi-purpose land use kind of experiment towards producing um, healthy tree fruit and nuts um, with no chemical intervention and also supporting um, grazing animals. A herd of grazing sheep is the current focus and we've worked in some, some pastured poultry into the system. Um, so I guess this is a little bit of a contrast or a break with what everybody else has been talking about, you know, sort of talking from a production agriculture standpoint um, but from an ecological uh, perspective in, in contrast with some of the more um, overarching watershed and hydrology concepts. But um, I'm going to just show some pictures. Most of my slideshows that I make are just, just photos and I'll talk to you a little bit about what you're seeing. So um, most of the things I'm going to show you is specifically about our silvo pasture practice. And so for those of you to whom this is a new concept, silvo pasture simply refers to the intentional combination of livestock. Um, this can take a number of different forms um, and tree crops. So, you know, the, there's, there's a lot of diversity in, in what those models can look like. Mostly in the United States at this point, these systems are being integrated with large grazing animals, so primarily cattle and um, timber plantings, rather than some of these more alternative I guess spins on silvo pasture, which is something um, that we are doing here. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Mount Warner, historically the site of apple growing, pear growing, you know, just palm fruits, traditional orchards, um, as well as sheep, which is the focus of myself and my partner, Rachel Haas. Um, we, we have our fledgling grass-fed lamb and poultry business now called Meadow Fed Lamb that's operating at Preservation Orchard. And what you see here is our group of ewes who are feeding on woody perennials. Um, this particular photo is just sort of introductory, but just to give you an idea of the various types of forage that's growing on the orchard. Um, so this, this area is, is kind of interesting has a, has a unique history of cultivation. Obviously we have remnants of indigenous agriculture up there in terms of the species that we are finding, you know, growing in profusion in the pastures, things like ostrich fern, um, asparagus, generally, you know, known as food crops, but also some more obscure um, wild food plants like Apias americana, aka uh, groundnut. Um, there's, there's kind of a lot of substance there that we need to just take a lot of time to understand in greater detail. But um, as the fragmentation of those long-term ecosystems that were on this site have kind of collapsed, like the you know chestnut tree blight had a big impact on all the northeastern forests, but definitely on this site as well. Um, there have been a lot of ecological niches opened up with the repeated soil disturbance, including that most recently in 2017 where we have um, huge amounts of vine growth and unwanted sprout land converted back into what I would consider, you know, productive pasture that we're using 
for grazing. Um, in a rotational method, we, we move our animals to new grass um, every one to two days, yielding you know really high high quality forage growth and effective grazing rather than the sort of continuous style of grazing where animals just dwell in the same area for a long time. Um, I'm going to switch to a new shot to show you more of the focus of what I want to talk about, which is um, integration of the fruit you know, producing trees um, as well as the grazing animals. So on a basic level, growing apples um, you know, by the books, by the books I mean based on agricultural best practices as issued by University of Massachusetts Extension, as well as basically all literature that's being, has been published, um, recognizes the sole land use function for a given area that's planted with apple trees as being just to raise apples. Um, when in reality, the, the land that apple trees are growing on are part of a larger ecosystem. All food systems that include tree, uh, you know, fruit or nut bearing trees have a lot going on the understory in that you know that's only one component not even to mention the you know possibly other ecosystems going on fungally or you know within the soil but most of the time you have a carbon dioxide you know sort of problem with just mowing down excess undergrowth at least at least two to three times during the growing season before apples get harvested this is a you know almost unavoidable in, in the apple industry. You don't really see this very often, but one way to minimize the cost input, basically for um, keeping the understory clean. Um, when I say clean, I mean just free of, of vegetation that would make it um, you know, stress trees for resource, nutrient resource availability, water uptake, et cetera, is keeping this understory nice and clean. So we've been using our sort of Although grease and clever can do attitude to try and find ways that we can integrate them safely without causing harm to the trees uh, and also you know, finding ways that we can use grazing animals, grazing sheep as a tool um, and that has come up in a couple of different ways. One of which is you can see sort of, I'm going to move my cursor over the tree on the left here in the foreground, but there's a few cut marks. If you look closely, you can see. So summer pruning is something that we do. Um, for a couple reasons, to monitor bacterial diseases like fire blight, which is very common, fire blight or common common disease in orchards. I come from a tree physiology and pruning background, um, and so that's something that I've you know spent a lot of time in this orchard doing is monitoring for things like fire blight, and then to lesser extent lesser lesser diseases that can cause issues during the summer, um, and actually harvesting that diseased material and offering that to the grazing herds as they move through the aisleways. Um, what they do is they metabolize the diseased plant material moving through their digestive system. They actually dispense with that in a non-chemical non way and they derive nutrition from it. So you're sort of killing two birds with one stone. And that's kind of the whole, the whole idea with silvopasture is turning your byproduct or your, your waste into another no possible gain. So as they move through these aisleways, they're depositing manure and helping the trees um, keep nice, lush foliage, good productive veg vegetative growth, and um, you know, good return bloom. Meaning that you know, the year after a big crop, you can see in this photo. This is from earlier this year. You have a very, very big crop on the trees this year. Um, you need to make sure that the trees have adequate nutrition uh, for return bloom. Meaning flower buds for the following year. So in this in this way we're also looking out for um, the other the additional sort of carbon footprint of synthetic fertilizer um, that is generally just sort of thought, thought of as a, a necessity in commercial apple growing that there's a fertility program which is usually um, you know not non-organic in most cases due to the cost in, you know uh, problem there. This is a great way that we can for, for a little bit of extra labor trade in that for uh, I, I think a cleaner and more uh, desirable nutrient package for the health of the orchard. Um, additionally, apple trees provide a lot of different shade and windbreak benefits for our sheep. 
Um, so we're back to the group of views now. The former photo was all the, the males, our rams. Now we're out of apples and into chestnuts. So a little bit of the sort of area that you're looking at here. This is the chestnut block at Preservation Orchard. And that is, if you are familiar with riparian buffers and how those are structured in relationship to bodies of water, this is sort of, um, I guess you could, you could consider this one sort of set of fields away from the actual water's edge of Lake Warner. Um, uh, the parcel actually extends to the water's edge and um, we're sort of thinking about how agricultural practices on this particular site are going to have an effect, an immediate and, you know, evident effect on the health of the watershed. And so luckily we're in the business of planting trees, which is a great way to, you know, secure water, minimize surface runoff, hold soil where it needs to be. But I did mention earlier in our, in our you know, my, my feel here that this is a site of great disturbance, you know, and I say disturbance, meaning that there have been a lot of changes in this landscape, um, including very recently some serious ones where a lot of trees were uh, removed in, in with, with the plan to replace those trees with things that are more desirable for various reasons. But um, as a result of that, the soil is incredibly uh, active fungally. Mycorrhizal fungus is really, really present. We're very lucky for that because that has the um, knock-on effect of helping us get through really dry spells. We haven't had that issue this year, but um, for those of you who don't have that kind of background with, with tree crops and decaying roots, but um, white fungus, mycorrhizal fungi, those are things that help soil retain moisture. Um, and I'm not going to speak at it from, from a really scientific point of view here, but just as a practical practical understanding of, of what that does for us is, um, you know, when you, when you are to remove a tree or even prune, prune off a branch of a tree, a corresponding root and, and whatever roots are left behind if a tree is actually removed, but even when you prune a branch off, a corresponding root beneath the soil starts to decay and die back. And that dieback starts to feed soil microbes, um, bacteria, and fungus, most notably, uh, classification of fungus known as mycorrhizal fungi. And there's hundreds of species that make that up. Some are visible and some are invisible when you actually take out like a decaying root from the ground. Um, those are really important. We're gaining more understanding about the role of mycorrhizae in sequestration of carbon dioxide within the soil, as well as just more practical things that we you know, really feel the effects of in an immediate sense, like uh, water retention. So we're trying to take advantage of the mycorrhizal fungi that are basically there from, from the huge amount of woody perennial plants that were removed from the site and, uh, you know, try and establish some new roots in there in a, in a sort of grazing and pruning regime that makes sense for maximizing the amount of grip on the soil that we can, we can have in terms of minimizing surface water runoff. Because as you know, I mean, it's a, it's a small slope, but it is a slope nonetheless that drains directly into the water. We want to make sure that we're capturing nutrients, locking them in place so that the pastures and the tree crops that we're growing are going to get the most of that. So um, I thank my, my other half for being sort of a continual subject in these photos. Um, back to the apple trees. I wanted to show a couple photos just of what basically a before and after that they're doing or what we're looking at um, within, within the basically system of the orchard, what, what we want to start with and what we want to end with. In, in the space of about a day, they'll take unmown understory and turn it into something that we're very satisfied with leaving behind and then moving to the next aisleway. So we, we actually install this electronet fencing um, right up to the trunks of the trees and, and basically enclosing just the aisleway. We don't want the sheep getting anywhere really close to the tree trunks because they're surprisingly drowsy, willing to eat bark and twigs and leaves of trees, which we don't mind so much about the leaves of trees, but we want them to leave the bark and the vascular tissue of the trees alone. <laughs> so this is about halfway through eating, um, but I think I have another good photos. I'm wondering why I can't, oh, whoop, too far. So this is right when they've moved into a fresh lane. 
and you can see how close we get that netting right up to the tree so we can get every blade of grass and, and get the nutrition and manure deposited right under the drip lines of these trees. And this, by the way, is a dwarf orchard. We also have newer plantings that are not quite past establishment growth yet but are going to be much larger trees when they become mature. But as an example, it's easy to see sort of before, and then I'll go to the next photos after. You can see that Rachel, my partner, is walking through a freshly mown aisleway there and the next one over, and they're gonna do the same thing. This takes them about 24 hours and we move them very quickly. And so you can see that the rate of regrowth, if you look all the way at the left of the photo, the two aisleways, I'll put my cursor over it so I can hopefully help you guys highlight that, but the farthest aisleways where you see those rows of trees, those are much greener. So that's the rate of regrowth um, that you're gonna see even after one pass of grazing. A lot of this nutrition and manure is super bioavailable to the plants and they're gonna uptake that pretty quickly, especially in rainy years. So the lane that Rachel's walking through, that was grazed probably a day or two prior and then you can imagine the same rate. Um, so this frequent rotation also begets rapid regrowth and um, makes it so we can cycle through uh, a bit more effectively. Um, and so I wanna talk about one quickly before I sort of get ready for questions, um, but talk about some of the challenges that we have as livestock producers in the Northeast. We have a short growing season. You can't graze through the winter because snow starts to pile up and that's kind of a big issue. So everyone in the Northeast who's ever had animals understands you have to have hay. So you have to pack up the grass on the field, dry it down, put it in pills and put it in a barn. That's one way to do it. Um, we've done that with you know good success. We have the ability to cut hay on the orchard itself, but it's a challenge because you don't always have the best weather for making hay. Um, this year is a good example of that. Also, uh, it cuts away at the land function. You can't really stack too many land functions with hay. You can't really hay effectively in rows of trees. And that's something that we're very, you know, in, uh, we're pretty committed to growing trees. And because of the shade that those trees cast, they're gonna really dumb down your ability to dry grass effectively. And so for a number of years, I've been following tree fodder principles, and we've talked a little bit about the benefits of that with the apple trees, but that's just one example um, where you can actually feed animals, either the fresh or dried leaves of trees, including woody parts, stems, tender twigs, that's all really good for them. A lot of people don't really understand that, that that's sort of part of the, the, the ancient practice of raising animals has, you know, it's not just grass. Um, it's really, it's really a wider picture of, of, you know, fodder that they're able to take in. So I'm going to flash this photo. This is sort of an alternative to the idea of grass hay. And this is a mulberry tree that has been pollarded. So pollards, if you guys are hip to that term, basically means trees that are repeatedly pruned at the same sites, causing scar tissue to form. Several species are really good. Um, examples of this type of growth, but mulberries are one that has really caught on for thousands and thousands of years across, I don't know, at least, at least four of the seven continents. They are really widely adaptable genus. They have great fruit qualities, great leaf qualities, and so things from silk mulberries to, you know, sheep and pig and cattle fodder and chicken feed have all been derived from various parts of the mulberry tree. Um, and this is basically what a mulberry tree looks like when you establish it and then start to prune it in this way where you cut the same sites forcing one-year-old growth and mulberries are nice because they can actually produce those lovely berries on the one-year-old wood instead of just older wood like with apples those are only two-year-old wood four-year-old wood and so our pruning regime sort of follow that but with this what you can do is gain a fruit harvest in the summertime when mulberries start to come off the trees late June all through July. If you have a very nice variety, sometimes you'll be lucky and get them into August. Um, and then following that, your, your leaf material is at its peak nutritive um, uh, uh, state at that, at that point in the late summer. And you shear off with a pair of secateurs or a pair of loppers or something, or sometimes even more autonomous mechanical equipment has been devised for this in highly commercialized systems. But harvesting that leaf fodder, harvesting all these twigs and basically drying those those can be done um, much, much more effectively in indoor settings than trying to dry hay um, 
that has to be done outdoors with the cooperation of the weather, which is always ever more unpredictable. And additionally, when you remember what I was talking about, mycorrhizal fungi, the relationship between pruning trees and the decaying of roots beneath the soil, which, by the way, is locking stable carbon in the form of, of organic matter and biomass beneath the soil, when you establish tree systems that harness uh, pollarding as a basically a pruning concept, a management regime, what you're doing is causing tons of really, really vigorous root growth, constantly trimming that back on a two-year cycle, getting a really, really great um, production of those mycorrhizal fungi within the soil. So it looks kind of ugly to some people to prune trees this way, but it's actually very effective in uh, improving the quality of soil, improving the capacity of soils to sequester carbon. And you're also gaining the benefit, um, if you do your homework and you understand your species that you're working with, you can get great fruit off of these kinds of mulberry trees, as an example. And additionally, sequester a little bit of additional animal fodder. So for those late winter days when you've got very little hay left in the barn, and you need to feed your animals until the pastures start to grow in New England, then you've got this sort of in your back pocket too. So we are looking really forward to installing some more, uh, I guess, alternative tree crop systems like mulberry pollards um, on the property, especially in the sites that have been used as hay fields and currently don't have any meaningful amount of living tree roots locking soil, minimizing surface water runoff, etc. cetera. Um, and there's a couple sloping areas on the farm where we're designing plantings for 2022 and 2023 at the moment. So we have that to look forward to. And uh, yeah, I love Silvo Pasture. I've been kind of dreaming about integrating systems like this since I was an undergrad at Hampshire College and uh, it's a treat to get to talk to you guys about it. And uh, yeah, anyone has any questions? Uh, I don't know if we're going to do this in the chat or if you guys want to just shout it out since this is the last one of the afternoon. But anyway, I'm cool with whatever. And uh, yeah, thanks. That's awesome, Matt. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for uh, inviting me to talk. I thought, think there was a question down here, Matt. Yeah, hi. Um, I was just curious if you've had trouble with any noxious weeds, how you would dress like horse nettle or... Oh, interesting you asked because we are dealing with that right now and it's uh, there's a little bit of sleep over the horse nettle specifically. Um, we've seen a massive influx of that in the last year. Um, and we have several theories as to why it's establishing uh, one working theory based on the locality and intensity of, of sort of where we have an epicenter of horse nettle growing, which is, for those of you who don't know that plant, it's a highly toxic nightshade plant related to tomatoes and eggplants and belladonna, deadly nightshade that are just really highly toxic to humans and livestock. They grow very effectively from rhizome, the so mowing it doesn't eliminate the plant, it just sort of weakens it. Um, but anyway, we, we are taking sort of a, an aggressive approach to this epicenter area where we're actually going to, um, we had started planting orchard there, but it did poorly, um, partly due to uh, like predation issues. We have a lot of deer and bulls in this area that I think took hold the rodents part, but that, that was uh, due to the soil disturbance, but there are, a major player there and so they ruined the tree planting and so we're just going to yank the trees from there transplant them into a different orchard block and actually uh, try and bear fallow this field where the horse nettle is most aggressive because um, again mowing is basically the only non-chemical option that you have and you have to mow it at repeated intervals um, if you turn a herd of sheep loose on it and they end up eating any of it, they'll have some serious health effects. And if you, you know, turn a herd of sheep loose on it and they just eat around it, then you'll basically have tons of seed of this noxious weed maturing. So uh, it's a bit of a tricky one because we want to at all costs avoid using glyphosate and dicamba, which the UMass extension, Ringling, has 
that is basically your only option in terms of eliminating horse nettle and losing pasture to it. So um, we're basically going to use tillage and uh, aggressive bare fallowing and cover cropping to try and at least at least knock it back to the point where manual um, elimination beyond that, you know, with with either close mowing with the scythe or just pulling it by hand, pulling deep rhizomes by hand at that point, is gonna be what we end up having to do to make meaningful change around that. Other than that, we have tons of noxious weeds like poison ivy and bittersweet. None of those are toxic to sheep and they eat them with uh, impunity and great pleasure actually. So it's nice to watch them gobble up poison ivy. Uh, it's actually pretty satisfying to watch, but um, horse nettle is a tricky one. Uh, we're still, I guess, in the midst of it. So if you have any tips, happy to uh, hear about that. I would, uh, well, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not going to go down to glyphosate, but um, the things that I've heard about tilling it are, uh, would indicate that that's a not, not a solution, unfortunately. Um, yes, I don't know. I, I've been um, asked to deal with it on a pasture and research the different ways of doing it and uh, um, it does seem like some of the other herbicides are the only option. Yeah some of the other aggressive herbicides are also things that will kill tree crops because of the soil activity. The dicamba is the one that Randall Prostek of UMass Extension has said this is your only bet and they all have scary labels like named like crazy firearms like rifle and like total killer kind of crazy stuff like that. But these are all things if you spray them and they even drift a little bit onto apple trees, they'll kill the apple tree too. So it's not really in our, in our dossier of options. So at the moment we're sort of, you know, sort of trying to walk a line between uh, aggressive mowing post, post bloom to exhaust the root reserves of the plant as well as possibly selective tillage with long, long bear fallowing. So possibly even multiple year bear fallowing. Um, with repeated with repeated tillage to try and exhaust those root reserves uh, before establishing a new cover, and then uh, additionally trying to develop um, some resistance within the grazing herd and try to select for animals that are either less sick or or show show no ill effects from consuming the plant, which is more of a long term vision. But it is it, it is documented that some animals can eat it with impunity, so we'll hopefully be selecting towards that in the future with our sheep uh, breeding and selection. Just one, one last, uh, if, if you did uh, the love of death herbicide application, I, I, I know the herbicides that will take out um, horse nettle and they are uh, a little hotter than glyphosate, but you could still use either a hood or use, you know, the glove of death. I don't know if you're familiar with that technique, but that. Yeah, that yeah. That minimizes minimizes drift, obviously. Yeah. What they're about now, because I didn't know what the heck was going on. Yeah, all right, it's, so, uh, it's all good. Yeah. Well, thank you, all of you. Um, I think we need to move on. It says here in my little schedule that um, there is a um, mandatory mentor check-in in the Zoom breakout rooms starting now from 1.30 to 2.15. So tell your friends and colleagues to sign up for the innovation contest through Eventbrite. It is never too late and have a great day. Thank you so much to all of you. For